I appreciate you not sunning yourselves and coming in to listen to me, so I'll try to be entertaining and uh, make it worth your while. Uh, thanks, Linda, and, and uh, it is a, it's an honor and a privilege to be participating in the, in the Ohio Annual Book Festival this year, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, as Linda said, I, I was a reporter for years, and I think that when, when you are a reporter, crime reporter, investigative reporter, you know, you are exposed to the real underbelly of society. And I don't think that you are, it, it, it's, it's a fact. And I think a lot of what, what I've done in the book, you know, that people will tell you, talk about fiction, and they always ask me, you know, where do you get your ideas? Where does this come from? How do you get started? And I, I for purposes of the book, I always talk about a point of entry. Okay, what is that one thing that, that, that gets the juices flowing and, and gets you started on a book? And and for the, and I like to describe it or you think about you saw the the movie The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy takes off for Oz down the yellow brick road. It, it starts at a little pinpoint and there there's a concentric circles that, that move around that pinpoint until eventually she's headed down the path. And if you think about that point of entry on a book, th that's, that's that little pinpoint there, because everything starts to revolve around that. Now, when I was with the dispatch, uh, I, I was doing a, a series of articles on wrongful convictions in Ohio. And I went to the state public defender and said, realizing, of course, that everyone in prison is not guilty. And do you have anyone that you think is really not guilty? And they gave me the name of a guy named Johnny Spurko, which is the greatest name for a criminal ever, Johnny Spurko. And Johnny was on death row for murdering a, a post mistress the, of a little tiny town of Elgin, Ohio, which is west of Lyman. I think there's like a, it was like 98 people, and the post office was literally a, maybe a 12 by 18 building. And she was the lone employee. She shows up one morning, is never seen again. Uh, Johnny is convicted of the murder and sentenced to death. A after, by the way, he, he basically dared the jury to give him the death penalty, and, and they did. They granted his wish. Um, but Johnny Spurko is as miserable a human being as ever walked God's earth, but he did not kill Betty Jane Mott. I'm absolutely, positively convinced, and I think my investigation proved that. But... As part of my story, I went down to the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in Lucasville to interview John. And after I got done, they gave me a little tour, which included a little tour of the death house, which in those days we used the electric chair. And, and it wasn't, you know, maybe four times as big as this rug, maybe not even that much. Uh, and the electric chair sat right in the middle of the room. And then off to the side, there was a door, and you walked in, there was a small horizontal room and it was a panel, and there were three buttons, a red button, a green button, and a white button. And on execution days, three security guards, or three prison guards, and it was, it was volunteer duty, but it was extra pay, would go into that room, and, and, and on the superintendent's signal, they all three would push their button, but only one of them, only one of the buttons was attached to the juice that, that sent the jolt to the electric. And, and that, I talked about that point of entry a minute ago. That was my point of entry. Because I was fascinated with this. Who, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but who signs up for that duty? You know, who, who will do that for the extra $35? And I, and, and, and I got, to, I, I always thought about, for years I had thought about that. And I came up with this idea for a book. And, and I was going to call the book The Button Man. And it was going to be about a prison guard who went in, and, and he was one of the guys that always signed up for this duty. And now I haven't put a word on paper yet. I'm just kind of kicking around ideas. And, and I'm thinking, maybe he's a former cop who got booted off the force because he's got a bad temper. You know, I'm trying to, because I picture him as kind of a, a grizzled, tough guy. And I'm thinking of a book about that he's going to befriend a guy on death row going back to Spurko now, who he starts to think, maybe this guy really didn't do it. Maybe he really didn't kill this guy. 
and then he begins his own investigation. That's as far as I got it, from my point of entry, to speak, and still haven't put a word on paper. So when I started to write, I wanted to create the scene. I write in, in, very, in a pretty structured manner. I like to have an outline. I call them buckets. You, know, you get ideas and you kind of just put them in buckets until you kind of sort out, here's what the story is going to look like. Now, I will tell you, a lot of writers will tell you that they never do that, that they sit down with an idea and they just start typing and their characters tell them wh when, when the book will end, where it's going to go, and where it will end. Okay? I've got a manuscript at home, it's probably 300,000 words, and my characters refuse to tell me how it's going to end. It just, it just goes on and on and on. They're at a cocktail party right now, I'm thinking of having a tanker truck full of napalm come crashing through the wall, boom. The end. Uh, but I, I can't write like that. I've got to have a structured, somewhat structured uh, outline and know, especially, how it's going to end, where it's going. So when I finally sit down to start writing, I started writing about the crime for which the guy on death row was wrongfully convicted. That's, that was what I thought. I'm going to, because I hadn't worked out all the other details, but I knew it was going to be a crime. I knew this guy would be wrongfully convicted, so I felt pretty confident I could sit down and start writing. So what happened is, four chapters into this book, I really, and, and in the first part of this book, it's a book about these four kids who kill another kid and then conspire to keep it a secret because someone's going to be wrongfully convicted. So that, that was how I started with this. Well, four chapters into it, I really liked these kids. I, I, and, and I really liked the voice by which, with which I was telling this story. And once I got into it, I thought, you know, I think there's more here with these kids than there would be with the, the guy on death row. And I was actually I was starting to relate to the kids. The narrator, I could hear my voice telling the story. So I, 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 at this point, it, it went off on a different direction. So the first part of the book it takes place in 1972 in a little town in, in Eastern Ohio. And once I got these four chapters, I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see where, and I take them up until high school. Now, I, mean, I, got them, I got them through high school, and now they can start to put this, so they can put this crime behind, this murder behind them. The second half of the book picks up 30 years later. And the narrator, who's one of the four boys, is now, you know, as I told you earlier, you know, I could hear myself telling this story. And I'm thinking, maybe my character becomes that prison guard. But I didn't want to be a prison guard. I thought it'd be much cooler to be an attorney, so I started switching it around. And in the second half, the main character, the narrator, is the uh, county prosecutor in Summit County, Akron. And he is running for Ohio Attorney General. That's when the wrongfully convicted guy gets out of prison and comes back and pays him a visit. So I, I, knew in my, I knew in my head that this was going to happen. But now, we, as I told you a minute ago, you know, I like to have things in, uh, in blocks, and, and kind of nice and neat and wrapped up. But I didn't have an ending for the book. And I wasn't going to just start writing and see, and see where it went. I had to have an ending. So pretty much, the writing process stopped. Now, I, I will tell you, I try to write every day. I try to do something on a book project every day, even if it's a couple of paragraphs, or sometimes I take, uh, I've got a digital recorder, I, I, or, and I, I might talk into that, but I try to do something on it every day. When I got to this point, I pretty much stalled out because I didn't want to keep writing until I knew how it ended. And I also, I figured once I had that spot on the horizon where I knew, okay, that's how it's going to end, then I could draw the roadmap to get there. And things change, you know, you juggle things around during the book. Something will happen in the second half of the book and you'll think, oh, you know what, if I go back and change this in the first half, then it's kind of a little, little neat little clue that you can give the reader, and, and, and things go back and forth. But at the end of the day, I finally figured out where the book was going. And that took a, it probably took a couple of weeks of 
just running various scenarios through your head. And a lot of times it's, uh, uh, brain, I mean, just that brainstorming. And sometimes it's coming up with just bizarre, uh, you know, bizarre endings that you know aren't going to particularly work, but it might trigger something else. And that's the way, that's the way we, uh, uh, favorite sons, you know, came, I was able to get that done. Uh, I like this book because, because I'm my own best friend, but beyond that, I like it because there's a lot of gray area. And I don't know if you remember the movie Unforgiven with uh, Gene Hackman, where the good guys weren't all good and the bad guys weren't all bad. There was a lot of gray. And, and I believe that's life. The, the, and, and so what I tried to write this, you know, even though the kids are trying to cover it up, and there's someone wrongfully convicted, you, you still have some empathy for them. And you still feel, well, yeah, what, what would I do? Uh, when one of the dads uh, try, is defending one of the kids, you'd have to ask yourself, what would you do if you, that was your son and, and you were a father in that place, and, and how are you going to work that? And I, and I like those shades of gray and try to make sure that, you know, that, 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 that you, when you come away from it, you, you at least understand it's not all right, it's not all wrong. Uh, this, this is my, uh, this was the second novel I completed, it's the, but it was the first one to get published. Uh, I have another novel coming out October 1st called The Essay, uh, which is set in Southern Ohio in Mitten County. It's about a, uh, an English teacher and a 17-year-old uh, student, a boy, wrong, really, really wrong side of the tracks kid who uh, wins a high school essay writing contest and no one believes he was capable of doing it. And this relationship he has with the teacher who basically puts her job on the line um, to defend him, try to show him a life away from poverty and alcohol that's defined his family for years. So we, I got that one finished, but this one sold first. So after this one sold, then my agent went back out with the essay, and, and, and she was able to, uh, to to get it sold. So uh, ho hopefully we can, you know, keep moving now. And, and I want to tell you, I, I, I love writing, and I wish I could write full time, you know, but I have to pay the bills, and, and I'm just not making enough off this. But hopefully one of these will will pop one of these days, and, and uh, I will be able to do that. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit now, and uh, do you have any questions before I get started? Yes, ma'am. I do. Um, as I remember, um, you changed the name of the town, Brilliant. Correct. But you didn't change the other names of nearby towns. Correct. And I'm wondering why you chose to do when I started writing the book, it, it, I was when I started writing those chapters. All that was going to be was a four four chapter setup, and then the scene was going to change back to the prison, and the focus would be on these prisoners. So I was just making up a town where, and I, I did Crystalton because Brilliant had crystal glass companies years ago, and then once I got started on it. The, the vision of things I had rolling in my head, I had to switch it around and work. It, it brilliant didn't lay out the way I needed it to for the book. So, so I just left it Crystalton, and then as I got started, then I incorporated Steubenville, Mingo Junction, Martins Ferry, all the surrounding communities, just, just because I thought, you know, it's going to give people a sense of place. They're going to know Crystalton is brilliant, and, and then just let it go. One of the other things, my mom was still living back in Brilliant. Everyone was trying to figure out, okay, who is who? <laughs> who are all these characters? And they're asking my mom, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, a, an old dear friend of mine called me up and goes, he said, I'm Dee Carmen. I said, yes, you are. And he's not. He really, you know, but, but he's a good friend of mine. You, know, you just kind of let it go. Um, he, he, there were aspects of Dee that I modeled after this kid, but I didn't take a person and try to, try to, try to incorporate. You know, it's just like... Uh, everyone wants to know early P.B. Sanchez. Is he a real guy? Well, no. no. But, but I can think of a guy who I was really scared of when I was a little kid, an older guy, who couldn't talk. And I was really afraid of him. And, and that was kind of the inspiration. 
for, for PD. And when you say that uh, learning didn't lay out like, are you talking about geographic? Geographic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I needed there to be a playground at the base of the hill, but that's where the little league field was. And I needed the one school to be right in the middle of the downtown, and it really wasn't. It was somewhere else. And so, so to do the things that I wanted to do, it just didn't geographically mesh. And I'm, I'm going to do another one at some point and use, and use Brilliant, but uh, the, the next one will be set in that area. And I make up another fictional town, but I refer to people going up the road to Brilliant and down the road to Tiltonsville. So keep it, keep, keep it in that Eastern Ohio, in that 